Hi there, it's time for another story time with Spencer. Things are changing with the column I've been reading to you for the last couple of months. We haven't done one in a while. The under analysis group is breaking up. That's right, the band's over with, and we don't even have Yoko Ono to blame. For you youngsters, look up who Yoko Ono was, I guess. Um, I'll let you know and keep you in the loop when and if a new host for the columns come up. In the meantime, please to enjoy. This one is uh, one I wrote a few months ago called Video Killed the Radio Lawyer. Here we go. Well, I thought we'd go. Here we go. I'm no stranger to technology in a law practice or a courtroom. My firm was ready to work remotely with little disruption when we were told we had to stay home. I have hired and sadly fired employees remotely. My team doesn't come to the office much anymore, and they're happy to have lost the commute. We will continue this at some level going forward, and if other businesses do the same, there will be more than a few fire sales on office building space. I've tried dozens of cases using my iPad and a trial presentation app, wandering around the courtroom like a genius bar escapee or hipster waiter. I'm no fan of Apple products, but because this app is only available for iOS, I am stuck with an iPad long after my divorce with the Mecca in Cupertino. I know that one must be careful when criticizing the house that Jobs built, as his followers are zealots, but it was an amicable split. I'm eager to get rid of the iPad, the last of my Apple gizmos. Because I also need to complete my continuing legal, legal education requirements for this year, I watched a webinar pitting the iPad against a laptop computer for trying lawsuits, thinking that this was my chance. I learned three things from this seminar. One, nothing has really changed in the last 10 years when it comes to trial presentation software. Two, California lawyers who presented the seminar are ridiculously good looking and could easily moonlight as actors and actresses. Three, my bank account is $100 lighter after paying the fee. On the plus side, the course was taught remotely and I wasted my time and money from the comfort of my own office. I may not have learned anything, but at least I didn't have to fight traffic or circle like a vulture for a parking spot. These days, we take the little victories when we can. Speaking of webinars and remote learning, lawyers are finally mostly fluent in online meetings. Fewer and fewer of us have to be reminded to mute ourselves in virtual court. I suspect that judges will continue to allow remote appearances even when it is safe to return to the courtroom, if not for the efficiency for the ability to mute lawyers at the touch of a button. We are all just a green screen away from working on a beach or in the mountains now, even the judges. Gone also are the days of everyone standing when the judge enters the courtroom. While we could certainly do so on camera, I bet that lawyers, like TV newscasters, are wearing shorts with their coats and ties. It is the mullet of the video conference and ignorance of how people are not dressing benefits everyone. If robes and wigs make a reappearance in American courthouses, shorts or leggings under the suits will be the reason. Trial by video is now a thing as well. The Floyd murder trial was televised, and more than a few armchair litigators have provided me with regular updates of what is going on in that courtroom. Some may ask why we even need a criminal trial after the event itself was captured on video. I didn't watch the trial, in part because I am a bit envious of lawyers who are trying cases. I haven't been in trial in so long it, that my lucky tie has gone out of style. Twice if you count the fact that it wasn't stylish in the first place. The other reason I haven't watched is burned in the memories of the O.J. Simpson criminal trial. Those of us old enough to remember it were glued to the television from the time the infamous white Ford Bronco fled from the police through the missteps of prosecutors and the unbridled grandstanding in court. I had only been practicing law for a few years when that trial happened and was eager for my chance to see a trial. After a hundred or so trials of my own, I'm less interested. I had a bit of a flashback to the Simpson trial when a Capitol building security was, was breached. I have since confirmed that the painted shaman was not Cato Kalin. I still can't see a Ford Bronco without checking the air for police helicopters. Youngsters, we will wait while you Google it. Unlike the Simpson trial, the judge providing over, presiding over the Floyd case has not let the proceedings turn into a circus. Part of that may be his no-nonsense demeanor. 
His approach does not make for good television, but it is much more appropriate to the administration of justice. The cameras did not keep him from dressing down witnesses or lawyers who forget where they were. The TV audience is learning what lawyers and jurors have long known. Most of a trial is drudgery. TV show lawyers don't have to worry with the monotony of laying foundations for documents, and their witnesses never get lost on the way to the courtroom. I've had that happen, by the way, and it's awful to get a phone call at a recess from a witness saying, how do I get to you? We tell them, and usually they would show up. TV lawyers also get commercial breaks where we presume snacks are passed around. While I hope that remote video court appearances are here to stay, I have no desire to try a case on television. Johnny Cochran was made for television. I was not. I spend enough time rethinking everything I do in the courtroom without the need for video replays and critical Twitter experts. Besides, if it is true that the camera adds 10 pounds, quarantine eating is the equivalent of three cameras on me already. And I don't need any agreement comments on that one for sure. Well, that's it for Storytime with Spencer this week or month or whenever we get to it again. Uh, thanks for tuning in and I appreciate